So hi, um, officially, hi, I'm James, and uh, Stacy, whom you met uh, coming in, gave me your name tag, uh, started New Ventures West in 1987, in fact, <coughs> about three blocks from here. And uh, since then, it's gotten bigger, so that we have offices, here's our main office, but we're also in Europe, in London, we're in uh, Switzerland, we're in Johannesburg and Cape Town, which are in South Africa, soon to be in Buenos Aires, which is the capital of Argentina, a little chart-free quiz there early in the morning. <laughs> we're also uh, doing a little bit of work in Singapore, and we're in Montreal doing the class in French, and sometimes in Paris doing the class in French. So it's spread out around the world. It's also found its way in all kinds of different places, not just different geographical locations, but all different spots in terms of um, kinds of people who do our work. Lots of the tech people love coming to our class because it's, uh, it meets their requirement for rigor and something that's interesting. So our class has depth and it has uh, applicability that people from the tech world like, but also our work is used in, um, all c in places like prisons and with people who are in dire poverty and people who are in all kinds of uh, difficulties. So somehow our method is applicable to pretty much everyone so far. Now you might be the exception, of course. <laughs> you could be the one. <coughs> but for example, in Singapore, um, where we do the class, we've done the class for eight years, people from 50 or 60 different countries and all those different kinds of cultural backgrounds come. I'm trying to say this so that uh, you can start to feel that there's a place for you in this, first of all, in this day that you're here, that you can feel included and that what you have to say and uh, who you are is uh, welcomed. Sometimes we, we wait for a couple of years <coughs> for, for that to occur and people have to pass our, our 1,000 safety checks. <coughs> we're in relationships, we're like pilots coming into a, a plane. You know, they have their list of safety checks. Am I safe, am I safe, am I safe? Which I can understand and appreciate that we can be that, that way but we have a few hours together. And this could be real hours together. We could really get, some, <coughs> we could really get something done here if you want. So our uh, school is about deep questioning. Not questioning, how do I get more? <laughs> Sometimes people think that that's what coaching is about. <laughs> I'm going to get more, more of, what, is, what are the sort of things that people might want more of? Status. Status, yeah. Money. Money. Performance. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Recognition. Yeah. Love. <coughs> what was that? Love. Love. <laughs> Friends. Knowledge. Start with kit. <laughs> How about good food? Mm -hmm. good do any of you already do coaching? Yes. 
can you have, can you hold your hands up for just a second more so I can see who you are? Great, thanks. So when your uh, clients come to you, what do they want more of? Is it this list or is it a different list? Mine is slightly different um, because I'm doing fertility coaching. So they want babies? Yeah. I honestly have to say, no one's ever come to me and say the purpose of my coming to Coach Biden is I want a baby. <laughs> but I said, well, yeah, it's going, yeah. Do you have anything to add? I guess a sense of being, feeling empowered. Empowered. Empowerment. Um, and even though they might not see it as much self knowledge. Yeah. Well, one of the things that when we're coaching, we catch on to pretty quickly is. People say what they want, which is almost always a symbol for something else. And so the something else is probably more like um, love or community or meaning or safety or something. And <clears throat> that can get positioned as I want to get promoted or I want to get more money or I want to get more in my organization. So I started out the sentence, as you might remember, saying that some people think coaching is about getting more. And um, more can be helpful and nice, and the trouble with how wh whatever we, we get, pretty soon we're going to want something else. <laughs> For example, I really love having community. Now I have so much community, I have no sense of myself anymore. I've just lost myself in the, pull, the push and pull of the community, and so on. So instead of a particular something, however beautiful, and there's a lot of beautiful things written here, we're always working on, in integral coaching, people's capacities. Because, well, why, why would it make sense to go for a capacity? It's, it's endless. Right, that's right. You can bring it on to the next thing. So if you, for example, get really terrific at listening, you can do that anywhere. It's not, there's not a boundary for it. Or if you discover a way of speaking that really inspires people or moves them to action or lets them get unstuck from where they are, you can bring that to your family or to your friends or to your workplace or to your church or your community or your wherever. So we work on capacities. And the main one you can is on our purpose statement over there that you can read at some point, and that's that people discover their ability, or the way we say it is, this is a sad day for me, this is my favorite color. Oh, oh I know. Just ran out. There's only one. What's that? There's only one? There's, another one, right? there's, there's only, uh, only one of my favorite color. Your directing me to this other shade of blue. Yeah, thank you very much. Save <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, me from my broken heart, my, my, my beloved is left. Yes, yeah. but there's... <laughs> did you need to grieve that first? <laughs> no, I, I, I kind of did a mini grieving while I was okay. talking. <laughs> so the capacity that we're mostly working on is to awaken and deepen. <coughs> so awaken means, in this case, <clears throat> what is it that I'm not able to pay attention to? What is it that I can't see? What is it that I can't experience? What is it that I'm blind to? And how, however awake we get, there's always more awake to get.
sometimes when we start to coach, we discover that our clients aren't able to do things that we think, of course, everyone can do. For example, tell what they're feeling. And when we're not awake to our emotional state, it's really difficult to have meaning. It's really difficult to connect to other people, unless you're super duper cute. <laughs> and some of you are, you know, I think you're in that range. Or you're really um, rich or I don't know what, famous? Maybe then it doesn't matter <coughs> if you can emotionally pay attention to other people. But otherwise, it's central. And also, in terms of being able to uncover our purpose and connect to community and so on, emotions are important to awaken to. Some of us have not awakened to our ability to change ourselves. We figured, okay, at some point, I don't know how old people get. At some point, uh, people are still, yeah, this could turn up. I could change. I could go this way. I could go that way. I could take on this whole new career. I could open myself to this kind of relationship. I could just arrive in Tokyo and learn Japanese and, and open my own Mexican restaurant. I could do all that. I could do all those things. But also I could shift myself internally. I could be less worried <coughs> about this. I could be more dedicated to that. But at some point, most people say, eh, this is how I am. I've come out of the oven. I'm baked. And now I have to make the best of it. So a lot of us have, have never awakened to the possibility that we can keep shifting. We are alive. Biology has helped us in the last few years with the discovery and the widespread knowledge that we have neuroplasticity, that our brains aren't done. Our nervous system isn't done. It keeps changing according to how we live. So that is a fantastic thing to awaken to. So it isn't just our, our little children, those of us who have uh, children. Anybody here a parent? Anybody here have parents? <laughs> yes, some of you don't raise your hand no matter what question I ask you. <laughs> Not the kind of person that participates. <laughs> I should just, anyway. We're on to that children are really soft and malleable and changeable. But then, as we grow older, we imagine that we're not that way anymore. We're less so, of course, than three-year-olds. But still, we can shift. We can awaken to that. It's spectacular when adults find that out that I thought I was encased in this personality. I thought I was encased in this personal history of things that happened to me or didn't happen to me, and that's what I have to work with. It's true that those things happened, and we can use them in a different way. So, um, <clears throat> I think I want to tell you one of the best ways to awaken. And it's to shift what your life's about. No, I'm not about to say leave your, <laughs> leave your jobs, leave, leave your relationships, leave your family. Just, I don't mean that when I say what your life's about. There's two categories that our life could be about in this model. One is we can be playing a game that a finite a finite game. Or we can be involved in an infinite game. Now game might be uh, a word that puts some of us off. 
so you can put a finite activity or an infinite activity if you want. So this is a matter of how our life is oriented. So a finite game means there's some people who are going to win, there's some people who are going to lose, there are external measures about how it's going, and the activities has, has tight boundaries. And at any given moment, some people are ahead, some people are behind, like what we're involved in at the moment in the U.S. in the presidential race, which apparently never stops. <laughs> apparently, it's happening right now, and every five minutes we find out <coughs> this person has a 7% lead in this county in Iowa. So a, a finite game where comparison is super important. How am I doing in comparison to other people? How am I um, doing in terms of what my peers are up to? All of that. And a finite game is a game of that's endless. <coughs> so here's a super clear example, I think a super simple example anyway. Some of you know that at the moment in France there is a big uh, football tournament, a big soccer tournament, the Women's World Cup happening, and that's a finite game. The game starts and X number of minutes later there's a winner or a loser, and some people are playing it like that, we won or we lost. You can see the limits of that, which is at some point these wonderfully gifted athletic people won't be able to play football, soccer anymore. Then that game's over. Some people are playing an infinite game there, which is how good can I get at anticipating what's going to happen? How calm can I be no matter what happens? That game, as you see, doesn't have an end. So you follow, is this clear enough so far? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here's the, here's the crucial point after all that, which is then how do we react to an event? Something happens. So in, an, in, in a finite game, the event that happened either helped me win the game or got in the way of winning the game. And the finite game is that. In an infinite game, it's here's a chance for me to practice being calm, no matter what happens. So it recontextualizes what's happening, and it also gives us the chance to reach backwards in time and give a different context to what's happened. So that's something that we can wake into. Which are you up to? And uh, the other thing that we're up to is that people uncover their capacity to deepen. So deepen, do you need something, Pi? Uh, no, well, we have one more person just arriving, so yeah. we need another chair. Yeah, we have chairs. There's a chair there. We were doing the airport, you know, putting my bag on a chair next to me just in case. We can deepen. What does deepen mean? Deepen means we can have more experience of contact, more experience of contact with ourselves, for example. More deeper contact with the people that are close by us. Deeper contact with meaning, deeper contact with beauty. And we, we can respond in a deeper way, in a way that has more heart, in a way that has more inclusion, in a way that has more time included in it, that, in, that has more <coughs> thoughtfulness in it, can deepen, deepen, deepen. So we have a school that's 
dedicated to all the students who come to us uh, uh, uncovering their ability to awaken and deepen and learning how to do that with other people. And then these wonderful more mores that I have here, or that we wrote, that I wrote down, the goals can happen as part of something deeper, as something ongoing. I'm supposing maybe everybody in the room, some of you look pretty young, but as the, here's one of the things that you have to look forward to as you get older. Everybody starts to look younger. <laughs> so after a while, I don't know. Are you 50 or are you 20? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Are you a teenager or you just had your third kid? I'm, I just, I don't, I can't get this anymore. So, um, awakening this way lets us awaken other people in the same way. <coughs> so that our life starts to have gigantic meaning. So where I started to go with that, being younger, is at some point we discover that uh, we go for something and it's fantastic to have it. Maybe you've discovered this with a new car. It's so great to have a new car. Especially if it's one that you've circled for a while. Oh my goodness, it's fun here. It smells so good, it drives so good. It's all shiny. Dens, the sound system is so grand, and that lasts, you know, up to five, seven days. <laughs> <laughs> and then it disappears, and it's just there. Anything that we get, we adapt to. Now, maybe some of you have been married for a long time, and you're still so eager to be with your partner like your first date with them. That's not the usual. <laughs> the usual is, however much we love the person, the excitement of the initial part of it fades into the background. So whatever we get, we're going to adapt to and after a short period of time, not appreciate it. So uh, those of you in, in, the, in the room have already made your first $100 million, you, you know that. It's like, it was hard to get, kind of. <laughs> but you know, now that you've got it, what? Now you go for a billion? The capacity to awaken and deepen also means that we have a wondrous appreciation for what's ever happening. We don't have to hold our breath till later. Later when, you might remember this from, from being a, a young person, when you were five or seven, you said, no, when I can, whatever go places on my own, or pick up and play my own video games, or whatever I can do on my own, then it'll be so great. But here you are, doing things on your own, is it so great? I mean, sometimes it is. <laughs> but other times it's, and that in fact is what our day is about today. How am I supposed to figure out what to do next? Anyway, what I'm, doing my best to show you is that there's a way of becoming a coach that's about building capacity. There's a way of living so that you continuously awaken and <clears throat> deepen. And we can do that in a way that brings that about for other, other people. And then, turns out, we have a, an amazing life ourselves. Pretty much everyone <coughs> who comes to New Ventures West, everyone who calls my friend Jess up on the phone says, and she asked them a question like, why, do you, uh, why are you interested in being a coach or why do you want to coach? Everyone says, that my favorite part of my job is being able to contribute to people. That when I'm talking to someone and they have that aha moment or people find their confidence or people find their 
mojo or people find their direction. That's so exciting. No one's ever said, most exciting uh, part of my work is the, the quarterly meetings when we go over the budget. I just, <laughs> oh my god, I just <laughs> circlet on my calendar, I get up early, go swimming, <laughs> sharpen those pencils, bring in my extra computer, oh boy. <coughs> So it's possible to have a, a life that is that way, where how, how we are, has that happened for other people? You might guess I have this gigantic prejudice, which is that what's closest into all of our hearts is that we want to contribute. And that's been hurt, and that's been crushed, and that's been brushed aside, and we were told, <coughs> yes, that would be really great for you to do, but meanwhile, can you get a business degree? Because that will give you more choice. Yeah, you notice all the people with business degrees, they just say, oh, I have so many choices. So our, our course of study in the year and what our coaches do with other people is this journey back to themselves. The self that we left when we took on getting ahead. I'm in favor of getting ahead. Why not? But if I've left myself behind, if I've left this close-in feeling, dedication that is in us to contribute, if that gets left behind, then whatever I accomplish is going to feel hollow. So that's um, an answer to the question that nobody asked, which is, what, what is this? <laughs> and it has a form. You can read about the form of our class. It's online, and Jess can answer it for you. I can answer it for you if you have those kind of questions. But this is the essence of it. <coughs> We've, um, we draw on all kinds of different human disciplines from neuroscience to biology to sociology and anthropology and uh, sorry I said the word anthropology which now it's gonna have, mean I have to tell you a story <laughs> so we I have a I we, we have a daughter who's an anthropologist <coughs> and uh, on Thursday night we got called and uh, told that our daughter was going to do her hooding ceremony. Are, are there any PhDs in the room? Yes. So you may be went to your hooding. Did you go to your hooding ceremony? No, you didn't have it. Where'd you Where'd you go? Stanford. Stanford. So Stanford has a hooding ceremony, which is at the end of the. What after everyone gets their degree, they bring all the PhD candidates into uh, a room or an outdoor place, and you have a ceremony where you get this. It's not really a hood, but this piece of garment put around your shoulders. Yeah, I don't remember. You don't remember. It was so long for you. <laughs> yeah. So it was just one of many PhDs. So. It was just folded into the graduation. Yes, it may be just folded into graduation. Uh, Jess or someone, can we find an extra chair? Yeah. Please? So um, anyway, our daughter got her PhD and she, she wasn't going to go through the ceremony. And then her uh, advisor told her, yes, you are going through the ceremony. So on Thursday night, she said, uh, she called us and said, it's tomorrow. <laughs> on Wednesday night, she called us and told us it was tomorrow. So anyway, that's what we did on Thursday. We saw our daughter get her, uh, her PhD, which took, in anthropology, took seven years. It's ridiculous. <coughs> but anyway, we draw on anthropology as part of this along with philosophy and psychology and spirituality so that we can keep uh, bringing in what human beings are learning about how we awaken and how we deepen anything. We don't, it's true, we don't use everything. We don't give out that many drugs in the class. Just we don't give out any drugs in the class. So we don't do drugs, but um, Breathing 
can do it, yoga can do it, exercise can do it, reading great philosophy can do it, all kinds of things. And we include all of it in our method. Does anybody have a question or comment about any of that? Can you say something about your background? Sure. What, what part is it would be interesting for you? All the irrelevant parts. So like like my, seven, my, my second grade teacher. And yes, all yeah. the irrelevant parts. <laughs> I don't know, what, what, what is the... How about just key pivotal points? So I, I can tell you a story about it. So how this um, started. I, was a, I worked on people's bodies. I was a rolfer, for those of you who know what rolfing is. Rolfing is this way of working with this, the soft tissue in the body so that people's uh, bodies get their chronic tension patterns taken out and the, the body gets more aligned so there's more ease in movement and so on. So Zong came, came to my practice who turned out to be an important management thinker named Fernando Flores. He wrote a book in his dissertation at Berkeley called Communication <coughs> and Action in the Office of the Future. And he made <coughs> at the time, this revolutionary comment, which is, management is speaking. <coughs> which, if you check it out, that's what managers are doing. They're talking. So how they talk and how they listen has everything to do with their success as a manager. But he also had the big philosophical background to it, a whole biological element in, in his work and so on. So in our relationship that started there, I began to work with him and started learning philosophy. So I got about a 10 year philosophy education the three years that I was around him in a very deep and personal way. And um, at some point my, uh, his, I got to lead classes for his company, then his company went away and I got hired by someone else to lead classes around the country. And during those classes I started saying, Aha, I can do a, I'm going to do a coaching course. And I just made all these extravagant promises about what this coaching course would be, even though I, I had not designed it yet. Did any of you do that? <laughs> Design, you know, you say, come next Thursday, you'll be at this amazing event. And you go home and you think, what am I going to do next Thursday? <laughs> anyway, so I did that and had a group of people sign up in New York, a group of people sign up here. <coughs> and, um, San Francisco, and started, like I said, around 87, something like that. So the, the basis of it was this work in speech acts. You can look this up if you're interested in speech act theory. John Searle's a big person, and John Austin's a big person in it. So I started there, and then I included more and more. So I'm a Zen student, so there is a uh, mindfulness in it. There's paying attention to what's arising now, letting go of what just happened, all the beautiful parts of Zen, which is, there's a lot more to it than that. And uh, then people started liking our class and wanting it to bring it to their other countries, which is how it got there. So my background uh, is what happened from my early intent of what, what can I do to help people out? What can I do to assist people? So rolfing was that. I got rolfed myself and it made my body so much easier. My experience of myself, I felt much freer internally. Let's bring that. Same thing when I was around Fernando's work. Oh, when people learn to do this amazing thing, make a request the world opens. Or when people learn this magic word that they were masters of when they were two but they forgot when they were growing up, which is no. Where no is not so easy for us to say. We could do an exercise in any moment. Just ask people to say no. I could make up the most ridiculous exercise. So I could say, you know, Omar, um, ask Nika, are you saying Nika? Ask Nika if, uh, she wants to uh, have a ride in your brand new Tesla, and she says no. 
if Nika is like a lot of us, even though it's made of exercise in a room, it's hard for our body to say no. So, I might, if he asked me, I might say something. I'm saying no, but that's only because it's an exercise in a room. I can't just say no. Anyway, this is grand power that I found in Fernando's work that I wanted to bring to others, which is why this whole coaching course started. And then I, I saw the limits of those. Really terrific, goes this far, where else can we go? Where else can we go? Where else can we go? So now there's about 20 of us uh, around the world who are leaders and in training to be leaders of this from all different, as you would imagine, all different states backgrounds. Is that, is that what you want to know or something else you want to know? Sure, I was missing a bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> Any other questions or? Yeah. You mentioned drawing from so many different disciplines and your story yeah. talks about kind of the origins of that. Yeah. I wonder how you've seen this continue to evolve over time. Maybe can you give some examples of recent, more recent changes you've made as, as you learn more about the program or through science or elsewhere? So the most startling one that's happening for me right at this moment <clears throat> I'm learning about aces. Not like I never played cards in my life. But I don't mean those kind of aces. I mean adverse childhood experiences. Some of you know about these. So the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, about 20 something years ago, did a study of 17,000 people and discovered. <coughs> that if people had four ACEs, four adverse childhood experiences, there's a list of 10 questions. If people have an answer of four or more of those, amazing, uh, amazingly horrible things are going to happen to them. Like, they're 32 times more likely to have a learning disability. If they have six or more, they're going to die 20 years earlier. So it's toxic stress that people live with. If people have, uh, I'll, I'll tell you the book because I'm reading it. It's called The Deepest Well. It's written by a woman from here, from San Francisco, who worked in the, she had a spectacular education at Stanford, among other places. She had, she has an MD plus a, a master's in public health. <clears throat> and she went, opened a clinic in Hunter's Point, which is the impoverished African American district in San Francisco. And she opened a clinic there and she started worrying about the children who came in. What is going on? Why is this, this boy, this adorable boy coming in, who's seven, only as tall as a four-year-old? What happened? Her last name is Harris. She has a huge heart and a really big brain. Uh, someone just told me that she just got, she got made the Surgeon General of California. Mm -hmm. So uh, I like our governor. I don't know what you like, what you think about him, but that he, that he picked her is terrific. She is the perfect person. So uh, there's a huge number of us who have these going on in the background in our life. And we're trying to coast around it instead of deal with it. So that's something I'm wondering about at the moment. When people are in stress, the hypothalamus gets smaller and smaller. The hypothalamus is the part of our brain that has to do with learning and memory. So under stress, we can't learn, we don't remember. Which is so why it's so hard 
for anyone who's in horrible stress. So you can imagine the kind of horrible stress people can be in where there's uh, danger in their environment, there's danger in their family, there's not enough money, not enough food, not enough uh, love. All the stress is happening. It's super hard to learn. And if you can't learn, and if you can't remember, it's hard to get out. Therefore, it goes on and 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 on. Do you find that could change after some deep healing? So that's that's an example of something. I'm uh, I'm reading a book called Aspiration. written by another brilliant person, another brilliant woman, in fact, but a brilliant contemporary philosopher who teaches at Chicago, University of Chicago. And aspiration is about how is it that we can go for being a kind of person and we don't know what it's like to be that kind of person. That sounds so abstract. But there are some, so in Linda's work, is it Linda? Leslie. Leslie, sorry, I can't read it from here. So in Leslie's world, many of the uh, people who come to her aspire to be parents. But they don't exactly, until you're a parent, you don't know what it is to be a parent. <laughs> you've been around, maybe you've been around a lot of children, mm -hmm. you watch your parents really closely, you can be that kind of job. But then when this child is your own, and they put this little person, this person, they're really, you might forget how little they are. They're really little. They're really little. And they put them in your arms and they say, bye-bye. <laughs> and you think, holy moly. Where's the, where's the owner's manual? Where's the, you know, where's the place you plug it in at this battery? <coughs> how does this go? Yeah. And yet, we aspire to be that. How does that happen? How can we do that? So that's that's coming in. I'm reading a book, and then I'll stop. <coughs> this is just me. This isn't the other 19 people. I'm reading this game, this book. Find that in Infinite Games. It's a book. I'm reading a book called. Um, Nervous states, which is not about anxiety. It's about uh, reason, rationality coming out of our political system. <coughs> and how does that, why, and how, and what can be done about that? So like everyone, I'm in our, our faculty, I'm working on my own development and learning other things, both in the small system within the person, but also in the wider systems within which we all live. Now I could go on and on about you know, 10 other things, but that's be a start. Any other impressions or anything about I want to say about my introduction to this? Yeah. Will you be talking about the, how the sessions are, are set up and what content is I wasn't each? going to. Okay. But I can do a, does anybody else want, want well, this? I, I, I figured that we went in that kind of detail my next question will be answered, which is um, kind of the spiritual underpinnings. Yeah, the spiritual underpinnings are um, that <clears throat> there's no such thing as an individual person. That uh, we, only, we exist as people because of everyone else. In other words, I mean, isn't that just, I think that's a factual claim. There's no such thing as an individual person. 
as in your body is made up of genetic material from other people, you did not generate your own genetic material, however self-made a person you think you are. You've uh, been around these people say, I'm a self-made man, I want to see their genetic factory, <laughs> where they made their genes, and then I want to see the factory <laughs> next door where they made their body. Anyway, we are um, always embedded in the middle of culture, which means the way we live is always affecting other people and other people are affecting us and human culture is in the middle of an ecosystem in which everything is affecting everything else. So in my view, spiritual, spirituality starts with that, that my life has been given to me as a gift. It doesn't belong to me, the me that I imagine that I am was given to me by my culture and my family. I didn't make me, even the sense of me I have is from my culture and from my family. Even if you're an American. You know, Americans are, I did it. I have my own views, just like everybody else. Anyway, I have a whole thing about how Americans think they're individual people, not affected by others. So spirituality starts with that, and it has as its uh, main components wisdom and compassion. So wisdom as in some of the things I'm saying here, which is our interconnectedness, having a longer horizon of time, knowing that and feeling that it isn't that stuff's happening to me, it's, it's happening. There's a lot to be said about wisdom and compassion is Feel, there's two things I want to say about it. One is it has to do with feeling the suffering of other people or the difficulty of other people, not only feeling it, but doing something about it. That's compassion. <coughs> I read this great definition of compassion last week, written by Joan Sutherland, who's a contemporary Zen teacher. She said that compassion isn't a commodity that we bring to a situation. It's our commitment to revealing <coughs> the intimacy that's already there. The intimacy that's already in the middle of situations is what compassion is. So I'm studying that. So that by its very nature fits with the infinite games that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. Is that enough of a, yeah. <coughs> During the break, uh, Jess or I or, or Jory or Stacy or someone can answer the question about what happens minute by minute in the class. Around 8.55, people come in, they sit down. Some people are drinking <laughs> tea. <laughs> we can give you a lot of tea, too. Obviously, big, not, not in such a silly way. So that's why I wanted to tell you, you had something? I had a thought. Please. Um, when we're playing the infinite game, well, let me start here. Um, as w when you speak of individuality, um, I find that amongst different people, you become, di you become different people to those yep. individuals. You think you're one person, right? But in this room, I'm sure every everyone has a different perception of each other as we all meet each other. Sure. Um, how does that infinite game play out? Because if we're playing the infinite game and we're meeting these individuals, will they still see us <coughs> in that different perspective or different um, perception, <coughs> or would they see us as as an <coughs> individual? Like, will they come, like, let's say, a random group of five people who sees me play this infinite game, would they uh -huh. see me as an, in, as an individual, or would they still see me as <coughs> a different, like, individually as mm -hmm. a different person? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I... Yeah, I, 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 I think I understand your question. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> do you all understand the question? 
If you could read. Yeah, I'll say something about it. So, so, yeah. so this is my take on it, is that if you're playing an infinite game mm -hmm. and you're, <coughs> you didn't say this part, but I'm filling in this detail, yes. and you are more unified, do other people see you, if five random people, would they see you as this unified self? Mm -hmm. And would you get uh, similar reports from all five people about mm -hmm. you? Mm -hmm. No. Because the reports of those five people is always up to those five people. So it's infinitely infinite. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what does happen as we play the infinite game is we get more unified within us. You know, that experience of being unified, instead of I want 10 things all at once and they're all contradictory, I want to have adventures but I also don't want to leave my house. And I really want to um, get in good shape, but you know, then again, I really love my Netflix. <laughs> I've, I've, I've noticed I've had my watch on, and it doesn't matter how many uh, episodes of uh, my shows I watch, my heart rate does not stay in the cardio range. <laughs> so anyway, there's, we have different selves within us pulling in, in different directions, and as we start to play an infinite game, we start to get more unified. Part of the trouble with playing finite games is we're playing lots of them at the same time. So I'm playing the game of get ahead at work, and then I'm playing the game of get ahead in my relationship, and then I'm playing the game of get ahead here, get ahead there, win here, win there. Instead of all those circumstances and all those relationships and all those situations are a chance for <coughs> me to develop or me to be able to be more expressive of compassion, whatever the infinite game is that I'm playing. Yeah. Question. So I probably missed the, uh, the previous thing at any uh -huh. part. So as you mentioned, the spirituality on the opinion you said both genetically and culturally, we're actually connected like, yeah. with the other people. So my question, actually this question has been in my head for a while. So um, what is authenticity? What does authenticity mean? I mean, is there really an authentic self? Is it an illusion? Or is it a story? Or is it something that you never know until you're dead? Like the last moment of your life. Like what's what does authentic self since like genetically and culturally we are not totally independent. So what does that authentic self? Because many people are saying you should be your self. You should be authentic. But then you mentioned that it's there seems not to be an authentic self, so that's my question. Most people when they say be authentic, especially if you hear it around here means uh, tell people what you think and tell people what you want and don't let them push you around and mm. uh, fight for your preference is essentially what people mean. Mm. Uh, and it, it sounds like you've given this some thought and you notice that uh, my preferences are just like I've said, my preferences, quote mine, are the ones that go with my time and place. So they're not mine. So um, <coughs> is there a self? <laughs> Which you're calling an authentic self. For you, is there a difference between an authentic self and a self? You can't answer for her. I said for her, you can't say yeah. <laughs> for you, yes. I don't really get that, honestly. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. so we'll just call it, we can call it that, it's fine. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So here's the, here's the trouble that we have with this question, and then I'll move on and we'll, we'll get to what we were setting out to do this morning, which is when to hold on and when to let go. This is mm -hmm. right in the territory. So. Mm -hmm. so when we ask the question, is there a self, we ask the question like, is there a chair in the other room? Which, uh, it'll make sense in a second. 
So we think when we ask this question, there's a self that's a an object. It's a something that exists, and it has permanence. It's just there. I have this authentic self, just like there's this nice blue chair in the other room. It's just there. And I, there's a self somewhere here that's there, and it doesn't change. That's partly what people might mean when they say authentic. The trouble with this notion, as you know from reading your um, Ryle, Gilbert Ryle, <laughs> no, I just, uh, <coughs> seven people read, Gilbert Ryle is a 20th century British philosopher who looked for the self philosophically. And all he saw was thoughts and feelings. Same thing the Hindus and the Buddhists found. When they looked for a self, <coughs> all they found was thoughts and ideas and feelings. Sometimes you, uh, around here you might hear, because we're, we're a mile and a half from Zen Center, that there isn't a self. What they mean by that is there isn't a something that's unchanging within us. So the dynamic self, the self is dynamic. It keeps changing, this, which is your point. There's, you're all, the, the self keeps changing. So the you, here's, here's one of the great mysteries. That when you're five years old, you felt like you. And when you were seven, and when you're 15, and when you're 25, if, it, if you're older than 25 in the room, like I said, I don't know how old anybody is. Or if you're 75, you still feel like you. But that you clearly isn't the same you. So the you that you were when you were five had different wants and desires and needs and different uh, appreciation of the world was in a totally different was totally different kind of person than the one that you were when you were 15. So it's dynamic keeps changing. But then, are some of the characters and values, kind of, if it's genetically born, should it, shouldn't it be fixed? Well, no, because uh, you've studied epigenetics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I See, know something about that. Right, so epigenetics, <laughs> we're losing people, we'll have to stop. Uh, <laughs> I know people also have to use the restroom. But epigenetics <laughs> means our, our genes are here, but they only get activated when certain events happen in the world. Mm. So certain of our genes only happen when we're eating certain foods or when we are in certain environments. Mm. So genes aren't machines that are gonna do their thing no matter what. Genes are potential mm -hmm. that can get activated or not depending. So it's, 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 so it's a little, hard. is it I mean, hard? Yeah, I mean, it is really you hard. You know yourself, but then yourself is dynamic. It right. It feels like you can never know yourself. Or, or, you always are knowing yourself. It's just that we don't understand this as knowing ourselves. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, confusing, like recently. Like so, uh, <laughs> it's really confusing. Yeah, it's confusing. Are you a reader of books? Uh, yes, I read some, some of the books, and I'm talking to some of my friends about this. They all want to know more about your, themselves, and they want to help them, but then I figured, what is self? I, I, I get confused about that. Yes, yeah, so, so mostly people don't ask it the deep way you're asking it. Most people just want to know, what do I want and need, and what's going to make me happy? Oh. That's mostly what people mean. So what's going to make me happy, and take away the, this, this anxiety that I'm in all the time. You can read a book by Almas. Almas is a contemporary uh, spiritual teacher, and his book is called The Pearl. And it's 10,000 other things, but you can start there. Thank you.
So as you can see, that kind of top, that kind of topic is really interesting for me, and it may not be at all interesting for anyone else. So I apologize if we <coughs> took you away. But sometimes that's how it goes in a group when someone brings up something. It also gives you a chance to play a, a finite or infinite game. A finite game is always, am I getting what I want? Excuse me, I'm leaving this restaurant, I'm leaving this relationship, I'm leaving this country, I'm leaving this planet, I'm not getting what I want. <laughs> and I paid good money. That's the, uh, <laughs> if you pay good money, you should get what you want. So that's this. When we're playing this, it's how can, how can I open myself to the meaning that's here? That might require me undoing what I want. But you've also, really what we've been looking at is you're saying people come and they say, how can I get what I want? And really what we've been saying is before you can even do that, you have to understand the I. Yeah, yeah. Who is that? Who's asking that? Huh? And where you come from. Yeah. And like you said, the ACE, ACE, that has something to do with all those <coughs> things to do with self is. Sorry, I didn't hear the last sentence. Nothing, it's fine. Mm -hmm. No, I want to hear your last <laughs> No, what I was saying is, I think a lot of it has to do with where we came from and our experiences, of course. So we have to acknowledge those. And, then the a and I like the ACE because that's very important. Because so much happens when you're three, four, five years old that many people don't realize. Shape everything. So just confirming what you're saying for myself. That's good. That's what I like. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So uh, some of you are old enough to know that there used to be this thing called an Etch-a-Sketch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anybody know what an Etch-a-Sketch is? Yes. yes. Well, a lot of people. Are they still around? They're yes. still around. They're, They're still, still around. around. Yes. They're back. You just played with them. Yeah. I thought they were long gone. The yeah. Neanderthal iPads. They're so great. <laughs> Let's still love the old stuff. So you can draw all kinds of things, and then here's the fun part. Then you just shake it, and it's gone. So we're just shaking all that part that we did up till now, and we're going to take on the topic of the day, which is uh, when to hold on and when to let go of things, and how to tell. So here's the, the premise behind all this that life keeps uh, moving and changing and <clears throat> how, we, how are we going to respond to that? When do I know it's time to leave this job and take on a new one or uh, <coughs> step out of this relationship and take on another one or move to a different place or no, change from Apple to Samsung. These life-changing decisions that we have. <laughs> How to tell? So we're going to um, instead of imagining that you're going to come to an answer, we're going to be working on. I raised it. Uh, building capacity. So let's do this before we start. Can, um, let's see if we can, I think this will make it easier. If we take a 10 minute break here, those of, of you who need a break, <coughs> and if we could do it in 10 minutes, that would be so grand. And then we'll get into it. I know you've been sitting here for a while. Try to dislodge some of the places we get stuck around. Trying to choose when to when to hold on and when to let go. And the first dilemma is that it's impossible to predict the future, and some and that is often the basis of, upon which we are deciding to do something or not of, of how it's going to turn out later. But we don't know how it's going to turn out later. 
I'm sure all of us in this room have been fooled over and over again. We thought for sure that was not going to happen, but then it did. No, never. Never. Never, <laughs> never, never. Or we were sure that it would happen, and it did. didn't. It did not. Did not. Like, uh, no, pet.com, what a great idea. <laughs> anyway, those of you, yes, it was in the, uh, the many uh, bubbles and bursting of bubbles in the financial technical world that we've lived through. Some of you have jobs that didn't exist when you were children, so when someone asked you when you were five years old, you could not have answered what you're doing now. When someone asked me when I was seven, I didn't say, I want to grow up and be an integral coach. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't, it wasn't such a, a, a monkey to be when I grew up. So we can't predict the future. We also can't predict um, what's going to make us happy. Some of you know Gilbert's work, the uh, Harvard professor, his book I think is called Stumbling on Happiness. His book is deeply researched and says that we are uh, terrible about predicting what's going to make us happy. Be because we, to, to pick up the topic that we are already on, we're imagining that the me that's existing now is the same person who's going to be here 10 years from now. So right now, I want <coughs> the chance to, to have enough money to travel. Because traveling and adventure, going to all these places is my thing. And then 10 years from now, when I have the money to do it, I think, oh, travel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Such a pain. All those lines, all those people. You go to the Vatican Museum, and there's 10 million other people going to the Vatican Museum on the same day. So, the, so I can't predict who I'm going to be in the future. Therefore, knowing what's going to make me happy is impossible. Don't worry, in the end this all turns out. I'm just making, I'm just showing the <laughs> good faults. We can't know what I'm going to want in the future. Our wanting comes and goes as we, as we shift. You can, you can ground all of this by just looking at your own life. Things that you've, and we spoke about this earlier this morning, something that I desperately had to have, really, really wanted, and then I can't even find out, where did, why did I want this? Where did that wanting go? Where's the big payoff <coughs> that's supposed to happen here after I got what I wanted? It was there for a short period of time. So some people try to finesse this by saying, okay, I won't hold on to anything, or I won't let go of anything. I'll just sort of live in this floaty place where at any moment I could change. Well, you can try that out and see how that feels. See how it affects your relationships. When someone says, should we have dinner tonight? And you say, well, you know, there's a lot of hours between now and tonight. <laughs> <laughs> who knows who I'll meet? Who knows who I'll be at 7 o'clock? <laughs> How can I commit the me at 7 o'clock now? And uh, as we all know, technology makes it so easy. Sorry, I told you I would marry you. But, you know, there was traffic. <laughs> that was at 5 o'clock. That was exactly, that was, that was earlier today. <laughs> that was the me that woke up this morning, not the me that's talking to you now. So it isn't possible to put everything in suspension. Because it's impossible to have, is to coordinate a life. As an example, we just gave no one will want to be in a relationship with you if you're like that. 
or nobody will want to hire you. Yes, the, the person that you hired on Monday isn't the person who woke up on Tuesday morning, so. Anyway, the other is, this is the third bullet point here. Are we, when we decide to hold on to something or to let go of something, what are we up to? Are, are we moving away from something? This means I want to make sure something doesn't happen. I want to make sure that, that I uh, have enough money. I want to make sure I have enough uh, people in my life. I want to make sure that I have, what else might you want that you want to make, <coughs> sure, make sure doesn't happen? Relationship? Yeah. Don't want the relationship to end. We're sort of moving away. I don't want that. I don't want that. And it's easy for us to uh, have have a response to the difficulties that happen inevitably in our life to try and set up our situation so that never happens again. <coughs> I'm never going to have anyone lie to me ever again. I don't know where you're going to move away to. <laughs> I'm never going to um, whatever fill it in. I'm never going to get trapped in work I don't like. Never. Yeah, we're just moving away, moving away. Or are we moving towards something? What are you moving towards? And do you even know when you make a, d a choice to hold on or to let go, whether you are moving towards or moving away? <coughs> so, as it says here, what would you add to that list of the dilemmas we have around when to hold on and when to let go. Why don't you take a few minutes and reflect on that? Yeah. Can you say something about moving towards? Yeah. <coughs> so, um, I... What's the question? I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. She, she asked, what about moving towards? So, uh, moving towards. So, I want to um, be skillful at something. I want to um, get promoted at my job. I want to be able to do this kind of coding. I want to be able to play this piece of music. I want I'm moving towards something. If not, I'm moving away from something. See the other difference. You imply that there's a movement towards and away, but also, isn't it also more an attitude of an openness or closeness? If you're moving away from something, you're closing yourself off to something. But if you're moving towards <coughs> something, there has to be an element of openness, of expectation, of, of opening your mind to what you might. So, yeah. so there's also a lack of, I think also when you move away from something, you're trying to control it. But when you move towards something, because you don't know what's going to happen, there has to be an element of um, an acceptance of a lack of control. Sometimes. Sometimes people try to move towards something and control the whole mm -hmm. thing. Like some people are trying to control their whole children's lives. Like, <laughs> Good luck with that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> You're moving towards Harvard starting now. <laughs> control. So I don't think control is there or not there according to what the person is moving towards. But openness and, and uh, rejection seem to be part of moving towards and moving away. So uh, please take a few moments and just write whatever you would add to this list. And then we'll just do this for a few minutes. If you want, you can turn your chairs around. There's tables behind you if that's a better surface for you to write on. We also have pens. Are we supposed to chat with each other? Not yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Am I supposed to add basic distinctions? Yeah, or? anything that you notice gets it, makes it difficult for you to hold on or let go. Anything you've discovered that makes it hard for you to hold on or let go. It doesn't have to be universal, it could just be about you.
See if you can find out something that you didn't already know. Do some inquiry. Really look at your life. Don't just write down what you know yourself to be. Ask, ask something deeper. Please. For example, how does what other people want from you fit in here? I'm sorry, say that again? How does what other people want from you fit into this when you hold on and when you let go? One more minute for this part. Just get as much done as you can in a minute. Let's, let's stop here, please. Come on back. Thank you very much. Come on back. Move away from that and move towards this. All right. So uh, we, can, we have time to hear from a few people. What, uh, what happened for you doing this? It's interesting to me and Monique, yeah. um, framed it in different light uh -huh. um, in terms of terms, but I know, the idea of pathway it was still the same way. Right. And the one thing that came out for me was like the fear of failure, I think, is obviously apparent, but I also think on the adverse side, there's a fear of success, right? Because as a first generation um, Chinese American, right, my parents didn't go to college, so I had to go to college, but I had no one to help me navigate that space. Uh -huh. I'm like, do I really want to go to college? Because I'm the first one to pioneer that. Uh -huh. So in that sense, I had to kind of let go of the community that I just had uh -huh. to go into the new space or go into like the grass is green type of side. Uh -huh. But I think that is really interesting depending on what socioeconomic class and resource availability you have might be able to give you the opportunity to go into and that can potentially help you move on or not move on. Right, thank you. Thanks for bringing that to us. When I was kind of thinking about this, I, I kind of shifted the thought process um, into a relationship. I started that way, and 
think about what makes it harder <coughs> for myself to let go or hold on in a relationship. I thought of others, so children, um, and then that kind of went to commitments. Um, and then I was thinking about it a little bit more in terms of things, just when I would clean out my garage, I'm very sentimental. So then I have a lot of memories, and I think that keeps, if I was just to say a relationship, it does keep a lot of people in relationships that they're not quite ready to let it go because they have all these fantastic memories. Um, and then I thought also, another thought that keeps me in a particular relationship is, or holding on to a specific thing, would be the thought of a future need or an unexpected need for that thing or person. I know that sounds horrible, but um, a lot of <coughs> basically... It's easier to hold on to this person because when I'm 80, you'll be hard to find because, someone. Or I may not have health insurance. That's and right. they bring the health insurance. <laughs> or, I mean, it sounds, like it's very honest. I just was thinking, you know, you never know when you're going to have this unexpected need. Mm -hmm. And when I was cleaning out my garage, I had this blender. And I thought, I already have a blender in the house, but you know... I may make margaritas outside and I might need two oh, blenders right. when I have this big party. <laughs> um, and then the last thing was really familiarity. That makes it very difficult to let go because I'm very drawn to the familiar. Thank you. So for, for all of these things, these are all areas that you can inquire into because however we are just to pick one thing sentimental so sentimental feels nice and warm and cozy and there's a price we pay for being sentimental but what's, the price? <laughs> uh, what's that how much I didn't understand. I'm asking, what's the price? I know. I, I, I understood what you said, but okay. some people chimed in. I didn't hear what they said when they were okay. chiming in. Clutter. Clutter, right. Um, also, um, we may be living in the past rather than living now. <coughs> For example, I think it's weird to go to Egypt so you can build good memories. <laughs> <laughs> How about go to Egypt? We're going to Egypt. You don't know what your memories are going to be when you're there. It's valuing the past more than now. Which means we might not be paying attention to now. <clears throat> Something to, to remember is that we don't have infinite capacity for paying attention. So what are we going to pay attention to? Um, also, we could study any of these for in great depth. So sometimes when people become sentimental, they become defensive. Like this. You remember that vacation we took in Egypt? Wasn't that wonderful? We had that time walking the desert in the morning and it was all quiet. Yeah. Um, Remember we got robbed in the afternoon? <laughs> I remember you got sick when you ate that food? Oh, no, 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 no. The wall. The wall. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, with this assignment, the question I sort of had and still have that is, our conflict I see is, how do I know when I'm moving toward versus moving away? Yeah, right. <coughs> So you thought I was going to tell you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we had it so obvious before. Yes, I'm clearly... No, no, I'm not leaving that bad relationship. I'm entering my good one. Really? So some... Oh, I want to say something. She's nodding her head so clearly. I do want to say something. <coughs> Um, something that will, uh, it will help us if we have a process of letting go. So someone made a little goofy remark when I had to let go of my, my marker. 
was I grieving? It was a silly throwaway comment, but when we leave something, it's important to grieve. To let ourselves feel everything. To have a chance to say what there is for us to say about it. To notice and appreciate what, ta what I gained from being in that relationship or whatever it is that I'm letting go of this job, appreciating it, also looking at what were the limitations of it, giving, our giving ourselves a chance to talk about all the different aspects of it, feel it emotionally, feel it in our body, all of the elements of it, and then maybe write about it, talk to people about it. I mean, this isn't about, I ran out of you know, my, my marker, but something major makes it more likely that I'm not moving away from, that I've integrated the learning and I'm not in a reactive, oh no, make sure that doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. um, let's start. Yeah. You talk about capacity and think also what, you know, the self is affected by the surroundings and everything. like. Who am I without that? Or who am I going to, like, do I have the container to become that? For, like, I really, really want that. But, ooh, it's really scary. What if I get it? And, and like, can I hold it? Because someone asked me, well, let's say that you are going to become that person you really want <coughs> really to be. Can you hold it? As if, can you, like, step into that? And I kind of backspace a little bit. Ooh, I don't know. Because the pressure or whatever is coming. So who am I if I get what I want or if I let go of what I think I don't want anymore? Mm. Like, am I okay with that identity? I mean, <coughs> can I, it's almost part like you're shedding skin. Yep, those are all things to consider. <coughs> there are in our next section here, two. So I'm, I just put three things there at the core of choice. And what Ava just brought us is one of them is uh, identity. So values. What's important to me, what's not important to me. Whenever you're studying values, I urge you to study two kinds of values. One is your espoused values. Yeah, this is what I tell people, including myself. I'm for honesty and forthrightness and transparency and uh, com uh, integrity and telling the truth and hard work. And then there's the actual way I live. What did you call that first? My espoused. Espoused, what I say. My espoused. Espoused. And then what are my real values? Yeah, 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 that's all really good, except under danger. I'm always going to do whatever I need to do to get what I want. Telling the truth is really nice, really good, but you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now when it comes down to negotiate. So don't imagine that your values are uh, <coughs> what you filled out on that, ex that uh, survey that you took, which showed you your values. What are they, really? Take some studying of your own life to see what your real values are. The way you can, one of the ways you can get to it is when you did in the past choose something, what was happening for you really? What I mean by really is drop out of the, the way you tell the story of it and see if you can remember, feel into what was going on with you. Then identity. What identity are you interested in, committed to opening up? What identity of yours are you ready to let go? This, of course, is going to affect everyone around you. So if you're the person that is supposed to solve every problem that everybody has, this might be in your family or your work. If you, in your family, you're supposed to be able to know everything about it. Uh, I have this rash what to do about it, to how do I do this calculus problem, to my <laughs> computer won't start, to there's a mouse in the kitchen, to 
my I don't you know my girlfriend just left me what do I do to does this go with this and if you say you know what I'm no longer the human Google <laughs> oh you are what your question is what I should wear that's really a good question your question is what is that rash Wow, I would be concerned about that too. <laughs> so if you shift your identity, it does affect everyone around you. As, so consider that when you're choosing. There isn't, our big choices shift our identity, how we know ourselves and how other people know us. Have you ever made a big choice and the people around you say, you're not that kind of person. When you say, you know what? I'm moving to Shanghai tomorrow. And they say, what? You're not that kind of person. You don't make impulsive choices. You don't even speak Mandarin. What are you doing? <laughs> you have to have pure water from, uh, what are you going to do? How? You won't be able to bring your own air supply there. You're going to have to bring the air. <laughs> the air of Shanghai. So sometimes our, our uh, social <coughs> surround pulls us into <coughs> maintaining our identity because they like it better. Can you imagine that every time you went to a restaurant with a person you ordered a totally different kind of food? Like the first year they know you, you're just doing salads and the next year you just <laughs> go for steak tartare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you say, no, just bring me a bottle of scotch and put it on the table, that's going to be my dinner. <laughs> anyway, identity is affected by choice. Consider that. Then what possibilities are you opening and what possibilities are you closing? There's no such thing as a choice of taking something on or letting it go that doesn't both open up possibilities and close possibilities. So as we did before, can you take, uh, please take a few moments and list what you would add to that list? Just take a few minutes and see what you would add to that list. And then we'll give you a chance to talk. But first, first do a little looking into your own life. when I say at the core of choice is what's the basis upon which you're choosing? I'm choosing because it opens up this possibility. I'm choosing it because it closes down that identity that I'm done with. I'm choosing because I'm enacting this value or I'm choosing because what else? But how come? choice. That's what I mean by the core.
<laughs> One more minute, please, for this part. See what you can get to in the next minute. <coughs> Okay, will you please have a different partner this time, which basically means turn your chair a different way. Okay. Questions, comments from, um, <laughs> questions or comments from this little like, exercise, little inquiry? I have been amazed that for both questions, I didn't think I had a lot to put down. And so I started thinking, and I put things down because that's what we were told to do. Yeah. But actually, in our discussion, once we started talking, both with two separate people, yeah. it was like, ah, oh, that let, ah, oh. oh. and so that was very useful. Yeah. Uh -huh. People can be something. Aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> that's why we talk. Yes. Well, it was just bouncing off. Yeah, the yeah, ideas I know. It does bigger. surprise us. Yes, that we are more fluid and deeper, and more going on with us than we thought there was. Some of you have been good students who are getting brown sheets. If you're not getting a brown sheet, you should do a deep examination <laughs> in your life. It's begging past around. We have, don't worry, we have plenty if you care about such things. Anybody else from that green sheet? <coughs> Sorry, the blue sheet still. Yeah. We talked about awareness, the perception of possibilities. Oh, sorry, you're just asking. No, go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm asking what you have to say about the exercise. We're talking about how it's not just like the presence of possibilities, but what we know about them um, and what we perceive about them from observations or experience and yeah, how that, that colors are. Right. Our but a possibility is only a possibility for me. It doesn't matter how other people see possibilities. Yeah. That's, that's, that sometimes that can be drives us crazy. I see lots of possibilities in you. Okay, that's good for you. <laughs> What's that got to do with me? So possibilities aren't something that exists in the world, like you can't, like a mountain exists in the world. Possibilities don't exist exist like that. My possibilities in my life only exist if I'm aware of them. Or define them. Sorry. Or define them. They don't. I mean, to be aware of them suggests that they're there, but they're not actually there until you define and identify them. Is that how it appears to you in your, in your experience? I think so. That you define it? Or does it just show up? It could just show up. Right. But I don't have enough time to just wait for them to show up. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes <laughs> we, uh, <coughs> possibilities sometimes come unbidden, like mm -hmm. it's just there. Other times we sit down and say, okay, I have to come up with a possibility just and that happened. It's now time for me to generate some new possibilities. That, that sometimes happens. Sometimes what happens is Jean was just saying, we're just talking to someone and <coughs> But what I was trying to distinguish was it has to happen somewhere in our consciousness for the count as a possibility for us. All right, so now we're going to study what's on the back of the, of the blue sheet. The three methods of encountering awakening guidance. Guidance as in 
some sense of inner knowing. But before that, we're going to re- read this poem by Jim Harrison called Becoming. Did everybody end up getting a co- have a copy of it? Yep. <coughs> Nowhere is it the same place as yesterday. None of us is the same person as yesterday. We finally die from the exhaustion of becoming. This downward southern jubilance is shared by the wind, bugs, birds, bears, and rivers, and perhaps the black holes in galactic space, where our souls will be gathered in an invisible thimble of antimatter. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Yes, trees were out as the wattles under the chin grow, the wiggle hands that try to strangle a wife beater in New York City in 1957. <coughs> we whirl with the earth, catching our breath as someone else. Our soft brains ill-trained except to watch ourselves disappear into the distance. Still, we love to make music of this puzzle. A poem a day um, helps us uh, helps us awaken, <laughs> but not schlocky poems. <laughs> schlocky poems. Um, <laughs> Roses red, buds are blue. Pigs are green, and shoo shoo shoo. That poem. <laughs> so we're going to um, do these exercises on the green sheet. So let me hand out the green sheet. Can now. Uh, Jerica. It's Jerica. Jerica. I'm sorry. Okay. Everybody in the world does that to you, don't they? Okay. They just look over there and they see J E something something and they think it's Jessica. Jerica. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to give you. Um, we're going to do an exercise to give you a chance to tune into your cognitive intelligence. Some of you may have been tuning into your cognitive intelligence uh, frequently. Some of you may rely on your cognitive intelligence. Some of you may have left it back in algebra class. (laughs) You're going on gut reactions this whole time. All right. As it says here, uh, please select the current situation where you're choosing whether to hold on or let go. It could be big or small. Then uh, make two lists. This is the cognitive (coughs) part. To make two lists. One, the good reasons to hold on. And second, good reasons to let go. Got that part? Then make two more lists. What unwanted thing will happen if you hold on? And what unwanted thing that will happen if you let go? Did you get all those lists? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. we'll give you uh, about five minutes or so to see what you can get done with those lists. Think about it.
one more minute for this part. Don't worry if you don't get everything down. You can write more later if you want. Okay, let's uh, stop that for now. If you did this on your own, you could do lots of research and <coughs> talk to lots of people and come back and write your list and keep updating your list according to what you discover in your research. And now we're going to do a different method of tuning into your guidance. So this requires you to put things, turn, turn your chairs back this way for a moment, please. Like I said, you can have. Uh, time later if you want to write more. This is uh, based on the work of Heart Math, which is a, a company in Scotts Valley near Santa Cruz. There, there are people who are a strange combination of cardiologists, people who know the physiology of the heart, and business consultants. So turn your chair around this way. Uh, put things down. Don't need notes. This is going to, don't need any notes. So can you just put everything that you're holding, <coughs> papers, pens, and so on down? Thank you very much. And if you could uh, put your feet flat on the floor. If you need to adjust your chair, there's a, a lever under your right hand. It'll let you go up or down. This is best done with your eyes closed. I'm going to walk you through these instructions. They're on the green sheet here. I'll use later. So, for about 30 seconds, so close your eyes. The room is safe. You're, you're okay here for a few minutes with your eyes closed. So take about 30 seconds to imagine, find, remember a place of great beauty and serenity for you. Open your, all of your senses to this place. What do you see? What do you hear? What do you feel? <coughs> Let yourself and your imagination be in this place for just a few moments. very much. Now please take three deep breaths as if you are breathing in and out of your heart. Three deep breaths slowly in, slowly out as if you're breathing in and out of your heart. Center of your chest. Then please ask your heart the question around what you're choosing and wait for your heart's response, which may take 30, 45, or 60 seconds. The response might be something you hear, understand, feel, sense.
Thank you very much. Will you please gently open your eyes? <coughs> just have a few seconds for you to tell the person next to you what, what happened for you in doing that. Is over around you. You can just join. It's fine. It's fine to, to be in groups of three. Yeah. <laughs> Tell quickly, tell, not the whole process, but just where you came out. Just where you came out at the end, please. Thirty seconds to wrap this up for everyone. Thirty seconds more. Give people a chance to say where they came out, please. Thanks everyone. Let's stop. Let's stop for now, please. <coughs> doing a brief experiential visit to these ways of checking in with yourself to see what's true, what's the, what makes sense for you to do, and all these from different three different centers of intelligence, our cognitive center, our emotional center here in the middle of our chest. And now we're going to work in a, another brief process in connecting in with somatic intelligence. Here we go. This is like... Uh, I don't know, at Disneyland, getting off one ride and getting right on <laughs> another one. So if you could, again, put everything down and close your eyes for a moment. This works really well if you could open your posture, which means have your spine be as straight as you can without <coughs> being uncomfortable, letting your feet be on the floor so that you're supported. eyes closed, notice your breath as it raises and lowers your abdomen. See how deeply into your abdomen you can feel your breath move. Don't change anything. Simply notice what's happening with your breath as you pay attention. With your awareness, please sense the current condition of your body. What sensations are there? This is feeling your body, not thinking about it, feeling it. Are some places tight and some places looser? Are some places heavier and some places lighter? What's the current condition? Please let yourself relax as much as you can and simply sense your body. Thank 
you please do what you can to stay in touch with the overall experience of being with your whole body. Then please ask your question and notice in what ways your body responds. Please don't pay attention so much this time to your thoughts and your emotions. And instead, open yourself to the sensations in your body and what they bring to you. Please keep sensing your body for a bit longer. <clears throat> Thank you very much. As I, as I said, that's just a brief visit to that way of checking into our inner guidance. Will you please take a, a moment and just be in the same group you were just in and say to your partner or partners what happened for you in doing that? As I said, I gave you the instructions for these three so you can try them out at home. It's safe to try at home. <laughs> Not like everything that you see, but this is safe to try at home. Anybody, uh, you just have a moment, but if someone has something that they wanted to ask or bring up from that, those three different ways in. Thank you. I loved it. Oh, good. I, I felt like it worked very well for me. Oh, three pieces. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So a lot of us um, don't explicitly pay attention to our bodies knowing, so it's a good place to cultivate. <clears throat> Your body knows all kinds of stuff that our, um, the rest of us isn't aware of, doesn't pay attention to. And some of us don't pay attention to our heart <coughs> because of historic reasons in our own life. And some of us do an incomplete job cognitively. We don't take in enough information. We don't take enough time to look at it process it. So please use all three. Seems to me to be the best way of doing it, not let one be the king or the queen. Yeah. Did you say that we will be getting us those scripts? It's on the green sheet. Oh, good. Thank you. So a couple things. Uh, one is you have a purple sheet around where you are. That if you fill it out, we, we will be happy to invite you to these events. We're going to keep doing these, as far as I know, until the electricity runs out. <laughs> and also we have a free newsletter that you can get. There's articles about coaching, there's book reviews, there's practices, there's poetry, all that in our newsletter. We only use our list for sending things from us. We don't lend them or send out information from anyone else. Our next professional coaching class happens in this very room in September. 
led by the amazing Adam Klein. There's a chance to meet Adam on June 25th. We have this event called a Meet the Leader Call, where people call in for an hour, and you are in a video if you can do it with Adam, who will answer whatever questions you have, and you get a feel for what it might be like to be with him and study with him. If that's of interest to you, you can indicate that on your purple sheet. It's called Meet the Leader Call. Our Foundations of Coaching class, which is the gateway to our programs, is happening here in August, August 7th and 8th. It's a standalone class in which you'll learn quite a lot about integral coaching, about how uh, some of the fundamental models. You'll have a chance to practice it with a fellow student and get some feedback about your current level of skill. Also, it's led by Carol, Carol, Carol Henme, who's been in this world of coaching in the Bay Area for, I don't know what, 25 years. So she brings a raft of experience to the class. So if that's of interest to you, it's uh, the 7th and 8th of August. Any of the classes that you sign up for while you're here today, we give you a little bit of a discount, a little $50 off as a way of thanking you for coming today. <coughs> Maybe the best way of getting to know our classes before you step into them is by coming and being a guest client. Have any of you ever been a guest client? Yes, some of you have, right? Yeah, it is. So uh, on uh, July 13th, which is a Saturday, there's a chance to work with someone pretty much all day. You'll have someone's full attention. This is a really good deal. You don't have to pay them. You never have to see them again. <laughs> and they'll give you their total attention for the day. You'll come early in the morning, you'll get matched up with someone in the class, and then you'll be off to be coached by them. And then you'll come back and tell us what happened. I've done this maybe 60 times. And uh, guests are so delighted that someone paid deep attention to them. And they, uh, they learned some new approaches to work with whatever issue they brought. So that's a chance for you, July 13th. James, I also have uh, two open coaching sessions next Saturday. If anybody wants to come next Saturday for a, for a shorter, um, yeah. 45 to 12.30 p.m. Come talk to yeah. So that's important because I'm leading that class. <laughs> so, uh, yes, come and talk to Jess if next Saturday works for you. There's where you came in with their coffee and tea and snacks where there's a place to sign up for the July 13th event. Last thing I want to tell you about in July 17, 18, and 19, which is probably a Tuesday, a Wednesday, and a Thursday, here in this room I'm leading a class called Masterful Conversations. It's a chance to take a deep experiential and simultaneously rigorously philosophical dive into language, which sounds totally weird and abstract, except the way we get things done, the way we build relationships, the way we repair relationships, the way we uh, build our identity, the way we have our life turn out is by how we speak and how we listen, which for most of us has been a random event. So here we study the principles of it in a way where you can get really, really, really good at it. And also there's a whole day that we spend on listening. And listening, as you all know, means more than I can repeat back to you what you said. <coughs> the recording device does that just perfectly well. But can we listen deeply to people's real intentions? Can we listen deeply enough to what people really care about their central concerns. And there's dates again, James, I'm sorry. I'm sorry? The dates, dates of the communication. Yeah. Uh, July 17, 18, 19. So you don't have to have done anything else with New Ventures West to be in our Masterful Conversations class. If you're in the world of getting things done, called being a, being a human being, this is a good class for that. We explore conversations for possibility, 
conversations for relationship, conversations for action, and listening as well. So when we, when we come back, I'm going to do a, a coaching session. We um, asked for volunteers, and we got only a little bit of a response about um, who wanted to be coached. So is anybody, as you're sitting here, open to having uh, doing a half-hour coaching session with me? Yes. Yes. What did you? Uh, Mine is um, trying to open up my heart again to having a, a serious, intimate relationship without the fear of abandonment that I'm feeling at this point. Okay. And the, I'm attracted to so many um, emotionally unavailable people. Yeah, good for you. <laughs> so I'm trying very hard Thank to you. teach I, I, I got on. I didn't mean to cut you off, but we're, I yeah, got ourselves behind the time here. A mind's more unformed, ill-formed. Doesn't matter. I'm at the beginning of trying to figure out how to move. Um, well, I, I said I was a coach, but I only coached a few people, and it kind of just randomly on the bus. <laughs> no, it, it's it's a full fledged operation. Okay. Right? It's very it's mm -hmm. very small. It's budding, um, okay. and so I'm at a very um, unclear place about how to develop myself further okay. and actually grow into a coach. Or I don't need the label grow into whatever it is. That yeah, is I understand. <laughs> Anyone else? So that's very. Yeah. Um, well, the rest of us were good. We don't. Yeah. yeah. I have a similar question. I've heard like because I worked in finance industry before and it's a very different path to become a coach. Yeah. I'm really interested in exploring, but I'm not so sure about this yeah. path. Yeah. I know men never need coaching, but are there any men here that... <laughs> <laughs> we don't. We, we're, we're sure we got it. <laughs> we have sympathy for other people who need coaching. <laughs> Our heart goes out to them and we wish them the best. All right, so we're, we're going to take uh, a 12-minute break. And uh, if you want to uh, sign up for to be a guest client or hear information about our classes, we're going to be in the room next door. Tell you any, we'll answer whatever questions you have. Body and said, I'm out of here. This relationship is not for me. Or, oh boy, I'm going to get married to that person. They don't know it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Anything big like that happened during the break? No? Oh, all right. <coughs> I realize I, I, I do want to continue my relationship oh. with almonds. Yes. <laughs> what? Yes. Almonds. She rediscovered her, her love and her devotion to almonds. Yes, I and rediscovered dark chocolate is the solution yes. to almost everything. <laughs> yeah. I, I told my That's husband so that I learned that the, uh, only women need coaching, not men. Yes. And he said, that confirms my long-held belief. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was joking. <laughs> oh, you hope yeah, so. Yeah, I, I was joking too. <laughs> yeah. 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 What was I overhearing? Uh, where was I? Anyway, I was overhearing two people talk about, two youngish women talking about trying to have relationships with men and how they can't find any emotionally mature men. <laughs> where are they? I said, they're in Berkeley. <laughs> they're in Berkeley? I don't know. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good answer. You're moving there. You really moved there.